Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Almighty Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. My name is Sayyida Farina Sami, and I immediately welcome to you all in the virtual webinar on the topic of invasive techniques in physical therapy for spasticity, for which the upstanding speaker is a professor with the head of Eye Physio Research Group at Universidad San Jorge and founding partner at Valdez Perta Physiotherapy Center as well, the president in the Association for Research in Motor Disability. With the gladden, I agree with the inclusion of you all, Dr. Pablo Herrero Gallico, PT, PhD. Okay, so I, I hope you can hear me, all of you well. Uh, First of all, I would like to, to thank Faina for the invitation to be with all of you today. Uh, I have prepared a, a presentation and some videos to show some clinical cases. And the idea is that uh, if you have any questions after the presentation, uh, I can reply to any doubts at the end of the presentation, okay? I also encourage you to, to disconnect all the microphones to avoid uh, noises, okay? So, well, um, I'm going to check. No? No? Yes, sir, it's showing now. Okay, I'm going to try if it works. And, and you can see everything here. Okay, now you can see everything now. Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, so now is it working? Yes, there sir. Are, there are a few people waiting, I think. Okay, so well, sorry for the technical problems. As I was uh, trying to explain, uh, the topic is about uh, invasive techniques in, in physical therapy, mainly to treat spasticity, but we will speak about uh, treating uh, in general uh, any dysfunction that a neurological patient may have, okay? So uh, the, the first thing I would like to, to comment is that, uh, I don't know which is the, the legal regulation there in, in your country, but as you may know, in some countries, physiotherapists are allowed to infiltrate uh, botulinum toxin. But in most of the countries, uh, physiotherapists are not, to, are not allowed to, to inject any uh, pharmacological agents. So because of that, we usually restrict to invasive techniques like dry needling or uh, dry needling combined with other physical agents like electrolysis or neuromodulation or similar things, okay? So the, the main idea I would like to transmit you is that uh, I don't know if this is your case or when you studied uh, at the university is that uh, usually when, when we attend the different lectures about uh, musculoskeletal practice, uh, now, uh, people or physios uh, treating all these people with musculoskeletal impairments are considering the role of the central nervous system, but perhaps the feeling or the experience you have is that when you were attending to the classes about neurological treatments, sometimes the musculoskeletal system was not uh, considered enough, okay? So, uh, the main idea that I would like to transmit is why do we need to split something in the human body that cannot be understood independently. So we need to manage all the musculoskeletal system, but also the central nervous system, okay? So the idea of doing it is that we will be accessing this central nervous system through the musculoskeletal one, but at the same time, we can treat specifically the, the musculoskeletal uh, system, okay? So, first of all, uh, I don't know if you are more or less familiar with these invasive techniques in physiotherapy, uh, concretely with um, dry kneeling, but uh, when these techniques, uh, dry kneeling, was uh, starting to be used in 
neurological uh, patients, um, well, the initial hypothesis was that gray milling was getting a mechanical denervation of the entail. So, as you know, that uh, trigger points are a dysfunction of these end plate areas. So there is a contraction not because of an excessive release of acetic saline. Okay. So this was one of the hypotheses. So initially, the idea is that, as you know, when we speak about hypertonia, we can define this as an increase of resistance to passive movement. So this is a clinical definition, but we have two components. One, which is defined as a peripheral component that is, it was thought to be addressed by dry kneeling in these trigger points. And the other, which is the neural component, the central component, what sometimes we call spasticity, or we can give some other names, okay? But the main difference between this central or peripheral component is that when we are assessing hypertonia, if there is a relevant central component, the resistance will be uh, very much velocity dependent. Whilst if the predominance is from this peripheral component, this won't be so velocity dependent when we make a stretch, okay? So, uh, I don't know if, yeah. I would like to show you one of the first clinical evidences because perhaps some of you have practiced with dry kneeling in musculoskeletal patients or some of you have heard about this uh, well, uh, use of dry kneeling for, for neurological patients. So one of the things we are going to realize is that uh, when we are doing uh, dry kneeling, uh, one of the objectives is to decrease the abnormal uh, muscle activity. So for example, if you can see now, I'm going to put a video. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to show you this video. If you can see the screen now. So now he, here we see a patient after a stroke with a lot of spasticity. You can see that there is a big resistance to open the hand. He cannot open actively. We, we are just making a stretch. So here we are palpating the trigger points and as you see in the screen, we are going to do a, a treatment with dry kneading. Here in this case is in the adductor policies and in the first dorsal interosseum. So what we know is that if we make this mechanical rupture of the dysfunctional end plate area, the muscle is going to release. So we will expect that this abnormal electrical activity coming from these dysfunctional muscles is going to stop, okay? But as we will discuss, uh, we will see also some indirect effects because you have to consider that when you are stimulating this area, which is innervated by median nerve, other muscles which are segmentally innervated, like flexor digitorum superficialis or profundus, they are also going to have an input and get it relaxed. So you will see how this is going to relax. Now there are some local twitches, but at the same time, you will see how all the finger flexors are relaxing, okay? So for example, in this case, you can see how just integrating a very short treatment lasting about one, two minutes, you can improve your physiotherapy results. Or after this treatment, this will allow you to treat the patient much better or to do some specific rehabilitation, okay? Or for example, in this patient which has a low function to wear orthosis or, well, to combine with other treatments, okay?
Okay, so the idea of this first clinical case is to show which is the peripheral effect of draining. We know this. Uh, this has been demonstrated in rats. We know the effects, how it works. And we also know, which is really important, that it doesn't have any uh, side effects. The only thing we will have to consider, and we will comment it later, is that we have to respect about five to seven days to do a repeated treatment in the same area because it needs a time for repairing, okay? So, what did we find in the first study? As you know, the use of dry needling uh, for spasticity or for neurological patients is very, very new. The first publication internationally was in 2007. So, when we designed this study, what we found is that um, it was just the opposite that we were thinking. We thought that initially, when we were treating a trigger point, we should be um, getting some peripheral effects, but we realized that um, when we treated the patients, the main component that was changing was the central component, so the one depending on velocity. So after dry kneeling, you will realize that the patient improved spasticity mainly, okay? So this is the first publication about the use of dry kneeling in neurological patients. Uh, this was published, in, as, as I told you, in the journal Musculoskeletal Pain in 2007. And well, this is a very uh, simple case, but for me it was important because it allowed many people to open their minds because my experience uh, was that initially uh, people was a bit reluctant to use dry needling in neurological patients so everybody was happy to to allow their patients to be treated with what we toxin but for example another alternative like dry needling was not being considered when this is something which is reasonable according to the target structure or the mechanical effects, okay? So uh, another thing I would, say, I would like to show you is a, a second clinical evidence because initially uh, we were always thinking about decreasing spasticity, but what you will realize when treating your patient is that when you do dry needing, there is a um, recovery of the biomechanics of the muscle. So the muscle is going to recruit much better. So this means that if it has an abnormal electrical activity, this is going to decrease. So spasticity is going to decrease. But if you have sometimes uh, patients that have some motor recruitment problems, you can increase the strength always that the strength is, uh, the lack of strength is due to the, the presence or the existence of uh, myofascial trigger points, okay? So I'm going to show you now uh, a video of one of my colleagues. He recorded this video when he was finishing and here you can see a patient with multiple sclerosis. All these videos are available on the website. So, for example, here you can see the assessment. You see there is some specificity or not. Okay. 
and for example what you can what you can see now is the same that you saw in the first video in this case the, the hand is completely different this is abnormal electrical activity but this problem that this patient has problems to recruit okay so for example in this case you can see some twitches and you can see after three weeks treatment how is the this is going to be a, a, a good change regarding the, the strength okay if you have a look to the initial situation you can see that there is a lack of strength, a lack of recruitment, with a lot of difficulties to open the, the hand. Okay, so if part of the lack of strength is provoked by trigger points, this can be restored. Okay, so you can see here. More or less the result after of three uh, weeks of treating with training and retraining this patient, okay? Well, so this is only uh, another idea so that you consider that training is not only to decrease spasticity, it's in general to improve function, and this includes improving the motor recruitment or uh, the strength, okay? Okay, another thing I would like to show you is a third clinical evidence uh, this is a paper that we also published uh, with Professor Sandra Calvo, that she's uh, doing the, the PhD in the in brain kneeling at our university. And this is one of the papers from her PhD studies. She was analyzing which was the effect of brain kneeling on the contractile properties. So what she did is to use the tensiomyography, which is an equipment that perhaps you, you may know. Um, this equipment is transmitting an electrical current, which is contracting the muscle, and then it measures, which is the displacement of the muscle, the muscle fibers, okay? So what did we see in this, uh, in this study? Well, we saw that the reply from the muscle was very different between the upper limb and the lower limb. So initially, the effect after treatment in breath was very good, mainly in the muscles in the upper limb. And sometimes it was even negative or muscles were being a bit stiffer after the treatment, which makes sense, okay, because sometimes if you do dry kneeling uh, in a patient, sometimes you will see that in the upper limb they relax a lot, but sometimes in the lower limb uh, they can relax, but in other cases, mainly in gastrocnemius or solutes, they can uh, be a bit sensitized or a bit stiff. So these uh, adverse effects, to, to say some way, they are going to last about 24 hours or a bit more, but not much more, okay? But in the follow-up, so after three weeks, you can see that most of the muscles continue improving, okay? I'm going to show you another uh, clinical case. This is another uh, clinical evidence, okay, of the effects. In this case, we are going to see a patient with a, a good functional level. So the objectives of the treatment is going to be uh, different, okay? So here you can see the video. And what I'm going to show you is some of the things I would like to focus. So this is a case of a patient that was attending to one of the courses here in Spain. And we asked this patient to take these bottles of antiseptic from one side Water, okay. So you can see some of the difficulties that the patient may experience. For example, when you are making the grip, this is in inflection, so the, the wrist is collapsing a bit in inflection, so it doesn't allow to make a good grip. There are some compensations in the trunk. But also a very important thing when you assess a patient is not the 
quantitative part is mainly the qualitative and this is what the patients are going to tell you. Have a look here to this grip and the difficulties that she has to release the, the grip, okay? So if you have a muscle with the spasticity, the problem is that, for example, now, if you want to release the grip, you are going to experience a lot of problems and if you increase your stress to release it, the contraction is increasing, so it's making more difficult every time, okay? So we are going to do right kneeling in different muscles like flexor digitorum, biceps, or here also in the adductor policies and first dorsal interosse. This hand looks not to be very spastic in this position, but as you saw, when it was involved some kind of active recruitment, it was fighting a lot of uh, spasticity, okay? So which is the idea? What we expect is that now, after doing drain kneeling in the flexor digitorum, the wrist is more aligned, but also the grip, you will see that is much more uh, smoother. So it's very, the, the movement is much more fluid. You, you can realize that the patient is moving much smoother or much more fluidly, okay? So this is some of the points I would like you to focus when you are treating a patient, not only considering the range of movement, but also the quality of movement, okay? Okay, we are going <clears throat> to follow with some more clinical evidence. This is another paper we published also with Sandra Calvo uh, in her PhD. And this is uh, about the effects of drain kneeling in the upper uh, central nervous system levels. So, for example, how can we explain that uh, a patient uh, like the previous one may have an improvement only doing drain kneeling in some muscles. This necessarily has to be explained because uh, there are some kind of changes or temporary changes in some upper levels in the central nervous system. So with this study, we conducted a study about electroencephalographic activity uh, after drain kneeling. And what we saw is that mainly in this area, FP1 and FP1, so the, these two lobes, some uh, waves were changing after drain kneeling. So according to the electroencephalographic activity and the electroencephalographic cordons, uh, what we show is that temporarily this area was changing and this was related with the uh, processing of sensory motor in information, okay? So this may explain why people may reorganize or improve um, the general motor function, okay? So, uh, which other evidences we may have? Well, what is very important is that after doing drain kneeling, you have to integrate all this work into functional treatment because this is what we call a biological uh, treatment. We just get some changes in the muscle, we get some, some changes in the central nervous system, but if we don't do any other thing more or additional, we are going to lose the effects in about a week, okay? So the most interesting point is to get most out of the treatment after the kneeling, okay? Or we can consider this right kneeling as a therapeutic window because, for example, this can allow us to do uh, some intensive rehabilitation okay so well this is mainly related with the intensive use so if you allow the patient to use more the upper or the lower limb you will benefit the patient of course okay so the idea of this drain kneeling is to use this plasticity to get the most out of treatment okay well you have uh, different publications uh, 
some some of them are in Spanish only, but for example, I contributed to a, to a book writing a chapter with my colleagues, and this is available in English. So this uh, book about advanced techniques in musculoskeletal medicine and physiotherapy has the chapter number nine, where you can have a lot of information about this. Okay. Uh, perhaps you saw in the social media now just um, about one week ago it was published this study this was one of the studies from one of my PhD uh, students uh, Juan Nicolás Cuenca and this is a very relevant study this is the last one to be published because it was carried out with people after stroke in a subacute phase and the most important thing for me is that we took a sample size of 218 patients, which is a lot, and we uh, made a propensity analysis to show comparable groups. So in the end, we had 80 people which were comparable, 40 in each group. So this is important because this was a, a, a trial, a, a control trial, but it was not randomized. We did the comparison according to the clinical practice. So from my point of view, although methodologically perhaps is not so strong, it is showing what is done in the clinical practice. And what we saw in this uh, research work is that there was an improvement of spasticity when dry kneeling was added to the standard physiotherapy treatment. Okay, so this is something to, to support the use of dry kneeling as a complement to a standard physiotherapy treatment. There is another uh, paper that I would like to comment is, now we have been focusing on spasticity, we have been focusing on function, but uh, what about pain? So uh, perhaps you treat many uh, patients after stroke that they complain about pain, shoulder pain or upper limb pain. So this is one study which is interesting because it showed that there is a high prevalence of trigger points in patient after stroke. So the trigger points may be contributing to the patient's pain. And that in this population of people with a stroke, the trigger points were associated with pain and dysfunction. So uh, whenever you have a patient with pain, I think you should explore for trigger points, okay? Because perhaps they can be a source of pain and, and dysfunction. Well, what about the assessment of these neurological patients? Because this is going to be a slightly different from the exploration of um, the musculoskeletal patient. So, well, we can do a clinical interview we can do some physical exploration as in the, in the test we did with the previous patient. So for example, uh, making some functional assessment, but after this functional assessment, the idea is that you can make some analytical tests, for example, to measure hypertonia and to know if the muscles are having mainly a central component for hypertonia or a peripheral component. Why is this uh, important? Well, this is important because if you have a patient with a high uh, affected or with a high or relevant uh, central component, dry kneeling is going to be a very good treatment. But if the problem is that hypertonia is mainly peripheral because this is due to remodeling of the tissue, dry kneeling is, is, is not going to be effective. So as a summary, what uh, we can say is that uh, if you have a patient and after the assessment, you see that there is a lot of spasticity or a big central or neural component, dry kneeling will probably help this patient a lot, okay? So once, we have done uh, this functional assessment and this analytical test. We have to explore trigger points. Sometimes we can explore them manually, but sometimes if they are deep, we have to explore them 
directly with the needle. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you are used to to use your uh, the ultrasound, for example, in your clinical practice. But for example, when you are exploring the trigger points, one of the options is to feel if there is any local twitch response uh, directly through the needle. Because sometimes if it's deep, it's impossible to see the local twitch or to feel it with the palpation hand. But uh, most of the times, the, the twitch is transmitted through the needle. But in other cases, if you have access to an ultrasound device, you can use to, to guide your treatment. So I'm going to show you, for example, one of these cases. Um, for example, Well, this is the gluteus muscle. Here, perhaps you can see the needle. And this is going into the gluteus. And here you show the local twitch. I'm going to show again. I don't know if you see the, the needle here. And then there is a twitch, a local twitch in the gluteus. For example, one very interesting thing is this is the same, but what I'm going to do is to palpate and I'm going to apply compression. So now it's relaxed, I'm palpating. And now I have inserted the needle here. Now I'm going to compress, as you can see, the muscle. And you will see that the local twitch is much more strong. Have you seen it? I'm going to put it again. There is a, a local twist there, okay? So why is this important? Because one of the one of the things I we usually recommend is that you have to do a compression. Twitch response, we can confirm that there is a, a trigger. Okay, so here you have some essential criteria that you can compare between dry kneeling for pain or dry kneeling for hypertonia and spasticity. Initially, what we are going to do is the same, we are going to palpate some top bands, but the difference is that in a neuro patient we are going to look for nodular areas. We are not going to look for, uh, for pain because usually these neurological patients, they don't complain of pain. They just have some kind of spasticity or dysfunction that affects their autonomy or their function, okay? So as you saw in the videos, what we are going to do is to assess the patient's movement, the function, but we can also check with the analytic test if there is a restriction of range of movement, if there is an increased resistance to passive movement, what we define clinically as hypertonia, or if there is any elicitation of the myotatic reflex. So if we make a stretching of the muscle and we go over the threshold, there is a myotatic reflex. There is a, a catch in the muscle, okay? So we have also some confirmatory criteria for the diagnosis of these trigger points. As you saw in the, in the videos or in the ultrasound, you can see or you can palpate a local twitch response or sometimes what we call a global twitch response, which is a bit more expanded. But in other cases, like in the first video I showed, you can see clearly a release of the contraction because there is a rupture. Uh, you are breaking the dysfunctional end plates. Okay, so if the muscle is contracting a lot and then you uh, realize that the muscle is relaxing, this is because of you have reached this contraction now. Okay, so this is a confirmatory observation.
Well, which is the application methodology? One of the main differences is that when we are going to treat a neuro patient, we do it in a submaximal spread position. This is not something we do with uh, people with pain because usually people with pain are not going to tolerate this submaximal stretch position. But why do we do this in neuro patients? Because, well, as you can imagine, when we place the muscle in a submaximal stretch position, we are getting some relaxation, but at the same time, we are feeling a lot of resistance. So if we are effective and we reach to the exact point, which is um, provoking this excessive activity, if we make this mechanical rupture of the dysfunctional entate area, we are going to see, we are going to realize that there is a relaxation. But in some cases, there are well, some exceptions. For example, if you think that the precision of your needle can be improved, for example, making uh, a pincer grip and this needs to be in a mid position, obviously, you can adapt it. Or, for example, if you want to improve the safety of your technique because you want to avoid uh, puncturing or needling uh, some structures like nerves, okay? Uh, or for example, if we remember this case about lack of strength, it doesn't make sense because there is not an excessive activity. So in these cases, you can uh, place the patient's muscle in a mid position, but for the rest, especially when there is a big spasticity, I recommend you to use this position of submaximal stretch. Then you can explore to look for trigger points and you have to, to achieve, or it's a, a good point to get locative response because this confirms that you are in a trigger point and usually just after this locative response, we are going to uh, realize of this neural or neuromuscular uh, release, okay? So sometimes we can maintain for some seconds and then we can just uh, remove the needle or we can just change the position, the direction and explore some more areas, okay? One of the important things that I commented to you is that if you do a dry needling treatment in a muscle, in a specific area, you should wait about seven days to make another treatment there because this tissue is going to take from five to seven days to be repaired, okay? Which is the application dosage? Well, this is very different between patients because uh, we usually adapt this to the patient's tolerance. What we try to do is to provide the greatest dosage possible, but having the caution mm -hmm. of not uh, sensitizing the patient. So you can do, for example, passing on our techniques, changing the direction, so you can be really aggressive, or you can just put the needle or you can even combine with uh, electrical currents or with galvanic currents like electrolysis, which can have an additional effect on the tissue, okay? So what do we do after doing dry kneeling? As I said, integrating this into a, ge a general treatment of rehabilitation, adapting the exercises to the functional possibilities, and what I always recommend is uh, to combine with uh, functional eccentric exercises because if you analyze the physiopathology of the trigger points, uh, they are going to be much benefited from doing some eccentric work. So I would like to show you a video, for example, in the case that, uh, for example, some of, sometimes uh, many people is afraid of doing brain healing in people taking anticoagulant uh, medication. So sometimes it's not a problem when this is uh, superficial muscles, but for example, for deep muscles, you can also use uh, the ultrasound. So imagine, for example, in this patient who is taking anticoagulated uh, drugs, if you see a vessel just here, what you can do is to move the needle, avoiding this vessel. So what you can do is before inserting the needle, you have this scan and you are going to control the area 
where the needle is inserting to be sure that you are not uh, reaching any big blood vessel. Why is this important? Because uh, bigger risk of having some kind of hemorrhage, okay? Well, uh, I would like to show you some more clinical cases uh, because I think it's interesting you, you see some other cases. So for example, I brought here a case of a, a child. This was done by one of my colleagues in, in Mexico, Roberto. So for example, in this case, you can see the, the type of gate and you see that after doing the annealing in rectal femoral, semimembranosus and gastrocnemius, there is a much better gate with more heel support. So you can see here how he's walking on his toes with flex knee and now is he's getting much better propulsion in the gate with more hip extension. So this is limited for children, but some children, if they tolerate well the needling treatment, they can also be benefited of this type of treatment instead of being infiltrated. Because the problem of botulinum toxin is that it has the risk of provoking weakness because it's provoking a chemical denervation or, or it can be a problem of getting an excessive dosing. I'm going to show you another one. This is also very interesting for the upper limb. So for example, you can see in this uh, patient, we are going to try to improve upper limb function. When we ask this patient to grip this bottle, uh, he's experiencing some problems, but after doing dry milling on different muscles, we are going to see that there is an improvement in the range of movement, but also there is an improvement in the general function of the, of the upper limb, okay? Besides, the patient is complaining of impeachment here because there is not a good pattern of recruitment. So what the patient is also explaining is that after the kneeling, this impeachment is decreasing and he is experiencing a better function, okay? So for example, we did dry kneeling in upper trapezius, lower trapezius, levator scapulae, subscapularis, quadratus lumborum, contralateralis, and then you can see the immediate effects just after doing dry kneeling. So the patient is increasing the range of movement a bit and he's orientating the upper limb much better with a bit more external rotation, okay? So these are immediate effects, but you have to work after the treatment with the patient a lot. Another case, uh, for example, this is very interesting. For example, in this case, uh, you can see how the patient has some trouble to take this button. He has a lot of internal rotation. The pattern is bad and he's compensating with the lumbar spine. But after dry kneeling, the orientation of the shoulder is going to be a bit more in external rotation. So it's going to avoid all the compensation. So now you will see that this is much better oriented. So there is not so much compensation here. So sometimes just helping the patient a bit, you are going to get uh, big changes or relevant changes, okay? 
and the last one, one for the gate, I'm going to show you another case. You have different cases in the website if you want to have a look to, to different cases, okay? So we have different objectives in this uh, patient. And for example, you can see some of the troubles of, of the patient now. There is a very short time in this supporting case of the affected side. So we did drain needling in iliac psoas, gluteus medius, gastrocnemius, medial gastrocnemius, and solus. So now you can see that the patient is improving the gait with much more stability. You have here the, the comparison with better support from the heel. No so much flexion in the in the knee. The length of the step is much better as you can see. and the stability of the, the knee is also much better. Okay, so <clears throat> just to finish, I would like to give you a few take home messages because, well, I think that drain can be an important therapeutic option to treat neurological patients because as we saw, it has some structural changes but it has some neuromodulation effects that you can uh, you can use to to improve the the patient's results okay to work intensively with the patient and this is something that has to be yet demonstrated but it could be an alternative to botulinum toxin infiltration first of all because it doesn't have any side effects well it also uh, is, is not so expensive like the botulinum toxin and we don't have any limits for the application we don't have the risk of provoking uh, muscle weakness okay so well if you want to go in depth with all these uh, contents you can follow us in, in facebook or you can have a look to different videos in the youtube channel and now, for example, we have just launched a practical manual of training with um, well different approaches of training for neurological patients. This is not yet available in English, but in about one month, th there will be a ebook. So if you go to the website, you will be able to download the, the book. Okay. So well, thanks for your attention. Uh, well, this is uh, hard work that I did, but also from all my colleagues in the research group at San Jorge University. So, well, this is something I, I have to thank to all of them because they are really working hard in many different areas related to invasive techniques, not only in neurological patients, but also in musculoskeletal or for other, uh, for other things. Okay. So, well, for, from my side, this is all. If you finally now want to, uh, to make any questions or any people in the audience have any questions, I would be happy to, to reply. Sorry, I'm trying to
सकता है क्वेश्चन आर इन दैट बॉक्स ओके well so i'm going to to follow the chat box if i forget anything please let me know well so i'm going to check just a moment mm. let me check Okay, the first question I see is uh, what eccentric exercises we can advise to spastic pacing after the leaning? This is a question from Suhata Motwani. So, well, um, when I told this, this is because, as you know, trigger points, the physiopathology is mainly depending on a contraction knot where there is an overlapping of, um, of the um, of the muscle fibers. So for example, I'm going to, to put a clinical case which is very, very frequent. Imagine that you have a patient with a lot of spasticity and it has um, some problems in the propulsion phase of the, of the gait. Usually you will find that the hip flexors are shortened and the eccentric movement is very restricted. So for example, if you do the kneeling in the iliopsoas, you are going to release this so then you can ask the patient to move uh, forward uh, working this uh, iliopsoas in an eccentric way so this is like working with them functionally but trying to reinforce this um, stretching phase the eccentric phase of the muscle i don't know if i'm explaining well the exercise this is a bit difficult from here but the idea is to take the benefit of this muscle is allowing this eccentric uh, contraction. Okay, the, the other uh, question, my, my email, I'm going to share my email here for all of you, if you have any question, okay. Um, okay, I'm going to follow with other questions. Um, okay, the other question is how to couple brain healing with uh, neuromuscular facilitation. Well, the, the idea I wanted to transmit is that brain healing is mainly working on a biological basis. So what you are going to do is to release the muscle uh, abnormal activity. So then if you are usually working with neuromuscular facilitation, you can benefit of this. If you are working with other neurodevelopment treatments, you can benefit of this. So as a summary, brain needing works on a muscle, in a, also in a central nervous system level, and then you have to follow doing the rest of exercises to benefit the patient, okay? Uh, another question from Justin is uh, which type of needle is used in brain healing? Well, initially we started to work with acupuncture needles, but after that uh, there were a, a better design for brain healing because uh, we need that the needles are much more stiff because you will realize that when you are needling trigger points, the muscle, especially in the spastic muscles, are going to be very uh, hard, very stiff. So there are specific needles for deep dry kneeling and they are much stiffer, okay? And another thing which is very important is that they are lubricated and very polished. So the insertion of the needle is not so uh, painful like in acupuncture because acupuncture needles are not lubricated and they are not so polished, okay? Okay, another question. Yeah, how to avoid clotting of blood while using dry kneeling? One of the main things you have to do when you are doing dry kneeling is to maintain the compression during the whole procedure. This is important because you need to do this to be specific 
and to be effective when needing a trigger point. But at the same time, if you have a patient with some uh, coagulating problems, you are uh, helping to, to avoid any hemorrhage. Obviously, you have to balance which is the real risk for this patient. Most of the patients taking anticoagulant, they don't have a real risk. But for example, if you are doing right healing in a very deep muscle or in a muscle which is close to veins mainly, there is a, a risk. So you should avoid or uh, you should use the ultrasound guide to use these kind of approaches, okay? Regarding the next question, uh, if we offer training for the NHS technique, we have conducted courses in many countries, in South America, in Europe, in the Middle East, uh, and in India, but now we were starting to teach in all this area of India and, and all these countries, but due to coronavirus, uh, it has been delayed. We have a, a course now in Emirates, I think in October, but you can see the website and you can see some courses there. Are any contraindications or precautions? Another question from Samuel. Well, there are some contraindications, but usually um, they are not big contraindications, they are not absolute. Which are the absolute? If the patient has fear of needles, it is an absolute contraindication. Or, for example, if the patient has some kind of allergy to the materials, okay? So this is a contraindication, which is absolute. But for example, regarding uh, anticoagulants or, well, other type of contraindications, they are uh, usually considered relative, okay? Because it depends on the muscle, the level of anticoagulants, the approach you use, okay? So there are not so many dangers. Sometimes what I, what I say is that the main contraindication is the therapist. If you don't have a good training, you have a lot of risk because, for example, if you are doing dry kneeling in the thorax, there have been um, a lot of cases of uh, pneumothorax. So, well, uh, obviously you have to, to have a good training to practice and therefore to, to avoid all this risk. I don't know if uh, you have any any other questions. Thank you, sir, to provide your time for such an edifying webinar. And thank you to all of you for your participation as a part of it. I will meet you all in the next. Goodbye and Allah Thank you very much also, Farina, from your side for organizing all this uh, webinar. And anyway, as I told you, if you need anything from me, I'm available at the email, okay? Thank you, sir, for your coordination. Bye.